everyone. Welcome to Next Steps in Editing at Flights of Foundry. Uh, before I introduce our fabulous panelists, I know you're all going to be very excited. I want to ask you to take your excited comments over to the Discord. It's at the Discord GG slash Dream Foundry, and it's in the Houdini um, subcategory on the left there, because we are in the Houdini room. And sometimes you're going to be able to see Houdini here behind me. But if you have questions for our panelists, which I'm sure is going to happen, please avail yourself of the um, WebEx panel to the right. They're, they call it chat, just think of it as questions today. And um, I think that that's the main thing. We've only got 15 minutes, so I'd love to get started. I'm Laura Blackwell. I'm your moderator today. Um, I am a writer as well as a copy editor. I'm the copy editor for the Deadlands, and I also free copy edit uh, novels freelance for some of the big four. And I co-host a weekly online speculative fiction reading series called The Storia. And now I would like to welcome our panelists in the order they appear on my screen, because that's easy. So today we have Kate Maruyama, L.D. Lewis, a guest of honor, uh, Leah Rambat, and Mia Tsa. Welcome. Please introduce yourselves. Um, hi, I'm Kate Maruyama, and um, for uh, my first novel, Harrogate was published by 47 North, where I got a really amazing um, developmental edit. Uh, my novella was published in a very small press here in LA, where I got a lovely developmental edit also. I have been uh, edited beautifully by um, really tiny magazines with students editing. Uh, I've been edited uh, in not the greatest way by very tiny magazines with students editing. And um, <laughs> I've been edited with a very light touch from some pro mags, so. Wonderful. Elle, tell us a little about yourself. Hi, I'm Elle, uh, pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am, <clears throat> Um, kind of all over the place uh, in terms of what I do in, in publishing. Uh, for the purposes of this panel, uh, I am an editor, um, freelance for some of the big four um, acquisitions for LeVar Burton Reads. Uh, let me see, I'm a publisher currently, still for now, at uh, Fireside Magazine. Um, and I am also a writer and so have been published, um, and edited, um, kindly slash harshly, um, by others. That's a lot. That was hard to condemn. If, if I, I was trying to go through like my bio mentally and be like, okay, this is relevant and this is relevant so that we're not here for like half an hour, just going through the stuff I do. <laughs> Thank you. No. And, um, uh, Leah Rembat. Hi, I'm Leah Rambat. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a speculative fiction author and editor. I um, mostly work with indie authors and I offer um, line developmental and copy editing services. Wonderful. Mia Tsai. Hey, I'm Mia, she, her. I am also an editor, surprise, and um, author. Um, for the editing side, um, I wear almost every single hat. Um, I copy edit, proofread, sensitivity read, and sometimes dev edit for big four, um, big four slash big five, and um, smaller, like medium-sized publications. I am a submissions editor for Giganota Source, so um, it is me you'll be seeing in your inbox most likely. Um, I also do, um, I have, freelance, like a freelance editing job that, um, you know, I, I edit for indie clients and I am also um, everything but the production editor for um, for nonfiction. I work with my um, industry journal and um, that's actually what I was, what I've been doing in the last couple of days is doing nonfiction editing. Wow, we have a fabulous array of editing expertise on display. Um, to help us sort of find our feet, I was hoping that I could get each of you to talk a little bit about what your first contact with a manuscript and its author might be. I know that some, several of you wear different hats, so maybe just pick one, come back in if you want to. Um, Elle, could we start with you? 
Um, most of uh, what I end up editing is submissions based. Um, I will either be hit up on my website that I should probably update um, and take on freelance projects um, from there. Uh, novellas that come in to me for consideration um, at tour.com. I will kind of pick through those. Um, let's see. For for uh, Lavar's podcast, those things we kind of I kind of source um, separately from various lists, reviewers I trust, uh, things I just kind of catch in the wild. Um, uh, we don't there. That's not so much editing as it is acquisitions, uh, which is part of what a lot of editors do, mm -hmm. um, because editors, you know, there's there's a lot of overlap into other departments as well. Um, Mostly submission stuff. Um, so the the more polished you are, um, the less of my time that ends up having to to be wasted. Uh, the 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 higher um, on my to do list you actually end up. Excellent, Leah. Tell us a little about your first contact with a manuscript and its writer. Sure. Um, so since I work mainly with indie authors, usually they contact me directly either through my website or if it's a referral, then usually the person who referred me offers up my email address. Um, and then we usually start a conversation about what the author's plans are for their manuscript, what it's about. Um, and then uh, Sometimes I, I always offer to do a sample edit just to see if we're a good fit because you always want to make sure that the editor that you're working with kind of shares your vision uh, for the story and that they're going to serve you and the story well. Um, and uh, there was one time where I was get, I, um, I got a client on referral and uh, they didn't want <laughs> to do or they didn't need to do a sample edit. They were just like, yeah, we'll work together. Let's do it. <laughs> so that's that was interesting. First time that ever happened to me. Um, but that's it for me. Nice. Mia. Um, I'll come from the other side of this um, in copy editing and proofreading and even um, sometimes with um, contract dev editing, um, you never have contact with the author. So the production ed editor or the managerial editor will reach out to you because um, many, many houses have gotten rid of their in-house copy editing proofreading staff. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm sure there are like a variety of reasons, um, all of which I'm not privy to. So they reach out to me and um, it's basically, you know, I open my inbox and see what Frisbees have been lobbed my direction. And I accept or decline depending on what my schedule is. And I also hope that it hasn't made, you know, a bad impression on this one production editor who's hit me up six times and I've said no to. Um, and then, um, and then I do the edit in the allotted time and I send it back. Um, occasionally, um, the I already follow like the authors that I'm editing who don't know that I'm editing them and I'll see tweets about my copy edits. Um, but weirdest editing, feeling. I can reach out. What was that? That's the weirdest feeling, isn't it? It is really weird. Yeah, when I see like people commenting on like dev edit comments or um, copy editing, I'm known for dropping like reaction gifts into my manuscripts, like shocked Pikachu face or um, what's his face from, um, oh, suddenly I can't remember. It's like the crying face gif, uh, Dawson, Dawson crying, right? Um, and then I can, and then I feel a little more empowered to reach out um, because I do think that there should be a relationship between copy editor and author on the author's terms. Uh, that's something totally different. But yes, generally, I do not have contact with authors either in fiction or in nonfiction. The only time I really get to talk to them um, are indie clients. That's very different. That's really interesting. And what about you, Kate? Um, my, I uh, don't edit professionally, and yet I kind of do because I uh, teach novel and I give people developmental edits on their entire novel. But I have, um, relevant to what's going on, here had friends who had a book that was about to come out from a very big house and the big house decided not to do a dev edit and they were absolutely mortified and terrified and did not were not ready to go out so i've done developmental edits for them um uh so yeah it's 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 a funny world out there and i, I think it's so interesting how um my i was 
published when I was published by 47 North, I got an excellent dab at it. And I know some people who didn't get one at all, which I think is a bit like being pushed out the front door in your underwear. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to me who chooses now, to. I, I have to follow up on that. Um, we've been very polite going around and now I hope we'll get a little more of the crosstalk because this really is a conversation among professionals. My gosh, I mean, if the publisher declines to do a dev edit, do, then what happens when they come in with an, a dev edit from outside? How does that change the schedule? And are there, did they accept everything? Yeah, well, the one they just, um, I think uh, in this one case, it was a house that had given the writer who had handed in what he believed because it was nonfiction or first draft, they gave him maybe seven notes. And he knew that they was not careful. So they actually didn't notice when the next draft came back vastly improved. Oh my God. Yeah, it's uh, so yeah, it's I, I would recommend all writers like really take care of yourselves. If you feel like you're not getting a very in-depth edit, go to um, a friend or hire someone because yeah, it's there's I've never been edited in a way that, with one exception that makes something worse, you know. <laughs> Wow. That, that is like this situation is both um, both affirming and not affirming at the same time. Like if you've busted your like your ass working on this manuscript and you know it lines up well and you send it, and you don't get very much feedback other than like you know let's work on these two chapters and it's like really line editing stuff. You're like, yay, did I do a good job? Mm -hmm. um, and then in your case or your friend's case, Kate, that is like that's that's nightmare fodder right there. <laughs> Yeah, now that brings me to think something that I think a lot of editors wonder about, or a lot of writers wonder about when they send things in. Most people have already worked with beta readers, often pretty extensively. So sometimes there isn't a big, a great understanding of what the difference is there. Um, Kate, would you like to start us off with that? Um, yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> I think the best example um, is Harrogate because I had beta readers for that and then my agent did some very deep edits, but he had seen it at very early stages. So when I got to my dev editor, there was some stuff that had, if you knew the novel intimately, there was stuff you recognized if you knew the characters instantly. And the developmental editor was like, I really don't like this character until about page 70. And I was like, ooh, that's a thing. And there were things that that he as a first reader misconstrued, um, which was very valuable to me because I was able to go through and shore that up. I'm not sure that answers. Oh. Yeah. Well, it, it does. I, I just think that the distinction isn't always clear to people who don't work extensively in the industry, especially on the inside. Beta you know? readers are my friends with whom I exchange manuscripts and mm -hmm. they read and give their feedback and their feedback is super varied. I go to one person because his feedback is super quirky all the time and it makes me see my novel in a new way. I go to another because she reads it as if it's the most exciting thing she's just bought and her reactions were, and she'll get to a page where she's like, uh-uh, I'm not with that person anymore. No, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of reaction is super valuable. Um, um, the developmental editor is usually hired by the press to go into the book deeply and to shore it up and make sure it's stronger and doing everything it needs to. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else have thoughts on that? Because I, I think that there's a big difference, but I just don't think it's always visible from the writer side. Okay. Big, big difference in what? Well, I, I'm, I'm writing stuff down because I have a terrible. Well, a beta reader and an editor both do some of the same things. Uh, yeah, but I think the perspective is so different, and I think that there's a lot more going on on the editorial side than a lot of writers know. I think it depends on what you're what you're going to your beta readers for and what they do professionally. If like I like I'm I'm an editor, but also um, I beta read some of my my friends and colleagues works work as well. So if they tell me what they need from it, if it's just general. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? I, I'll go through it with a less um, editorial eye just mm -hmm. to provide them with with that feedback. So it, it just, it depends on who your network of, of beta readers are. Okay, that makes good sense. Liam, Mia, any thoughts to add? Okay, that's fine. Um, I'd love for us to just get into a real chat here because it's really fun that way. So, uh, 
Elle, I'm curious to know, how do you think authors should prepare to work with editors? Um, be uh, mentally and emotionally prepared uh, mm -hmm. to have uh, your work um, kind of assessed by someone who is not you and who is not necessarily your friend. Um, a lot of times uh, writers come in with this, this purity of vision um, and what they're expecting from an editor is essentially a copy edit, like make sure that, you know, all of my punctuation marks are where they're supposed to be um, and don't touch any of this conceptually um, because this is my baby and, you know, whatever. Um, I, I, I get a lot of, um, I, I want to say about 60, 70% of the work um, that I get from freelance editorial things that are in need of dev edits or whatever people um, are not prepared uh, in, in that way for that. Um, and so uh, as an editor, um, you should be able to read that about the, the people whose who's work here um, you're editing. Um, there's a lot of care and sometimes hand holding that has to go into you know walking them through the experience um especially if they've never used a professional editor um before um or if they've sometimes they've gone over the work themselves with what they're satisfied um as like a in an editorial level um and it's not because they don't have <laughs> like that that formal experience um so it's not just care of the manuscript, but you want to make sure that you're working with an editor um, who is open to uh, questions, um, who's also open to feedback. If there's, you know, a communication issue, um, you, you want to make sure um, that respect of both the, the author and the work are kind of central. So if you are looking for a developmental editor or a line editor or a copy editor or whatever. Um, I often find that going on social media and just seeing what the what the personality type of the editor is, if they have that type of stuff available. Um, social media, it's a super, you know, casual space, obviously, and you kind of get a sense for, you know, is this person, uh, you know, going to take care of me and my and my work? Mm -hmm. um, that's probably all I have there. Did I answer the question? I think so, but it cool. could make the other answers as well. Leah, do you have another perspective to add? Well, I kind of just wanted to add to what Al had, has already said about um, making sure that um, with indie authors, they do come in sometimes not knowing exactly what kind of edit they they need or like kind of the scope of it, like how in depth you need to go with it. And that's kind of why I like having the sample edit because um, in addition to seeing if you're a good fit, it kind of just helps you see um, from the editor's, editor's side, what kind of edit should be done with the work or what needs to happen. Um, and then you can like make that suggestion to the author and then they can do with, what, with it what they will. Um, and then also um, the author just, Kind of gets that professional overlook briefly of us of the sample edit kind of like what more work they need to put into the manuscript to get it ready makes sense mia you're nodding yes um i was gonna jump off what Elle was saying too with regards to like how do you prepare to be edited right and um i think in in um many cases on the author side make sure you have a support group to vent to um that's so critical for for writers like you, you know, um, writing is emotional. We're extremely emotional people and we need to be able to vent and not to the editor who is working on your manuscript on the editorial side. Um, I would love for more clients to understand that it's not a value judgment on the work, right? I did not approach this work emotionally. Um, and this is as clear eyed as I can make it an assessment of what you're doing over there. So um, I can liken it to like, you know, my car breaks down, I bring it to a mechanic, the mechanic's not going to refuse to fix my car because of a typo. Like, because my my mats are dirty, the mechanic has decided that they hate my car. Like, that's not how it works. And that's not how editorial works either. Um, I do want to say that I feel very strongly that all of us in this um, in this panel edit quite differently from um, traditional, like old school, big uh, big five editors who are well known for being temperamental 
or extreme, extremely judgmental and very mean in their editorial comments. So um, that's that's a different perspective from how all of us work here. Agreed. And just to be clear, when you said you need a, that the writer needs a support group to vent to, you're not talking about Twitter, right? <laughs> that's right. Okay. What happens in the support group stays in the support group, and the support group is not Twitter. Okay, I think that that's a really good lesson. I think um, there's a, a the one uh, I would advise writers to understand when they go in that your book probably needs to change that this outside view is really beneficial and that a professional editor knows what they're doing. So rather than going through very slowly and reacting to each comment, read them all at once, go to bed, get up in the morning, and then start to work your way through. And that horrible feeling of dread that you have when you have all those notes sitting here actually does sort of, and I've learned this about myself, like there's one place, I'm, I have no resistance when I'm writing, but in editing, I always have this. I know when I start the process of making changes, it actually becomes a really lovely, amazing experience. And it's super valuable to have someone who went into your book, sees your book, notices your characters, and has um, notes as if they've, it, it's just a beautiful experience. Like I always end up like falling in love with my editors because of just, wow, somebody like acknowledged my work, they know it's good and, or it, well, obviously if, if it's gonna be published, um, but they they have ideas for making it better. It's, it's a really good experience if you let it, you just have to get over that initial dread. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I tell my clients sometimes, like in their once I deliver the uh, edit letter and the annotated manuscript, I think I think I'm just going to like append this to every single editorial email now. But like, please take 24 hours to yourself, and um, please do not reply to me before that 24 hour time is up. Um, for me personally, I need anywhere from 28 to 48 hours, or like an entire week where I just cry to myself. I, I need a week. Like that's that's my whole thing. Um, I have. Uh, I have screamed and wailed and gnashed teeth over um, a couple of editorial letters I've gotten. So um, definitely understand if you need to take some time um, to kind of look at the uh, at the feedback. Um, but also with that, um, I think authors should be should be aware that you have power in the editorial process as well. Um, you don't have to, even though like we're professional editors, you don't have to agree with every single thing that we put on um, your manuscript. So I think that there's there's a conversation to be had there about the power differential. Um, uh, generally speaking, uh, editors want uh, the best for you and your work, but if it doesn't coincide with your vision, your vision supersedes you know what what it is, where it is we're trying to steer the story. That makes a lot of Oh, oh, I was just going to say, and also, also, if uh, your editor misconstrues something in a very huge way, that just means you didn't make it clear. So I had a whole bunch of edits on um, Harrogate that really completely missed the point of what was supposed to be going on in a scene. And if you're a writer, I think, ah, it just means I didn't get it across. It's not that I'm fighting with this person. It's that I need to make this scene stronger so that it resonates in the way that I meant it to when I sat down to write it. Makes sense. I'll jump in here and say that sometimes that misconstrual is culturally based. So then you have to start thinking, okay, well, is it me? Is it the editor? And what do I have under my control to either make this more apparent or just ignore this, uh, the letter that was given me? Now, we have a follow on question from earlier, but I'd love to get into that a little bit. When should an author decide to ignore part of an edit and how should that be communicated? Good old step. Um, if we leave, uh, usually when you get an, get an edit letter, um, it will accompany, at least for me, um, an annotated um, copy of your manuscript. Um, and this is where I've left all of my notes, all of my um, you know blurbs about what's not making sense in this paragraph, whatever. Uh, you can choose to accept changes that are that I'm proposing in the in the document, or you can set them, which means that you've acknowledged the suggestion or whatever, but you're just going to not do it. Um, and so when we go back over the next pass um, for edits, I'll have to keep that in mind and see if that reframes some other um, thoughts I have about the story. Um, 
It's, I, I think that's kind of a, a difficult question. And I think you have to ask yourself where you're coming from um, with, with rejection of the edits. Is mm -hmm. it, um, uh, you are, you are a literary genius and how dare someone, you know, say this about, you know, your, your, your magnum opus, your masterpiece, um, or is it like, okay, well, this comment is genuinely a misunderstanding of the story. Um, and I think that if you're able to work with, um, your editor directly and it's not, um, you know, you're not going through someone like, like you would like at a big five. Um, I think then, uh, like what I do with my, um, uh, my freelance clients, um, they have access to me throughout, um, throughout the process. So if there's something that we need to talk about, I'm available to do that. Um, uh, and I think that that, I find that that clears like the lines of communication about like what each of us is misunderstanding about what the other person intends to do with the story. Um, so it's, it's about, I think stepping away from the notes helps with that as well. Um, I think my initial reactions use along the lines of I'm a genius. Who are you? Um, but that's not the correct approach. You kind of have to, you have to take a couple of days like, okay, maybe this person is right and, you know, try to do it their way. Makes sense. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit. I think this came up while Mia was talking. Um, what happens when there isn't much time to take mm -hmm. and breathe over the edits because of deadlines growing tight? What can an author do? I had a ridiculously swift turnaround with 47 North. They said, you have a month to edit this whole novel. And I thought that meant that I would get the notes and then have a month to make changes. But it turned out that the editor had it for the first week. I got it for the second week. The editor had it for the third week and I had one last week to finish everything. So it was, it was nightmarish. My oh, husband was very awful. sick at the time. So that was hilarious. Um, I would get up and have her puke in the bucket and then like get back down and continue editing. It was absolutely awful. <laughs> so yeah, it was super fast. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, fully, fully immersing in that case, it was very good because I did have a, uh, um, I was able to have a conversation with the editor about certain things. And so like, if I, if I was totally lost, like this one scene, I was like, did you, and spoiler alert, did you not get that her soul was going to disappear? You know, um, and he could say, no, didn't get it at all. And then I could be like, all right, well, I have to fix this. So we did have a conversation exchange. So that was very, very valuable. Um, but uh, yeah, there's sometimes a hard crunch time and you've just got to get in there and, and do what you can um, as swiftly as you can. I think that when we have such a tight turnaround for edits, you know, as the author, you have to decide, have to decide what's most important to you. Is the content most important or does looking good become most important? And it is the content and then you're going to have to rely on your team, depending on what kind of team your publisher has to, to kind of step in and like go fill in the cracks and go like patch some walls or patch holes that are there. So um, it, when I see some manuscripts come down in copy editing, sometimes I do see, okay, this must have been a very rushed edit because there's a lot more structurally that needs to be nudged. And so um, I will query the production editor or, you know, just make note of things that are inconsistent, um, which is part of my job anyway, but like inconsistent in a way that should have been picked up in a dev edit. Um, and then we just kind of keep going from there and um, hammer at it until it looks good enough. And also, if you do get that swift to turn around and you have your copy editor, I know uh, you editors probably don't want to hear this, but you can change your sentences. So with my copy edit, I went through and I did change, you know, and it drove them crazy. But, you know, I, it was the last time I could sit down with my manuscript again, and they oddly enough gave me two weeks for the copy edit so I could spend some time. Um, and uh, that rush job I was able to, like, you know, sit with. These are your words and they will be going out there. So. I realize that um, some folks may not know what the process is for TradPub, like the, the level, the process of edits. So um, real quick, um, the reason why I say like when you have a fast turnaround on the dev edit, um, you can rely on the chain to help you out is because you finish the dev edit and then your editor themselves will go and do some more editing quite possibly. And then it goes to copy edits, it comes back to you, you're allowed to make changes. Then from copy edits, it goes to the first, um, first proof for past page number one. Um, 
where you can, again, make changes, not huge ones, right? Like we're, we're hoping you're not like taking an entire level out of your house, but more like, um, kind of want to change like the siding on this one part. Um, and then um, it goes back again for a second round of proofreading and it comes back to you once more and hopefully you have no more like giant changes to make at that time. And then finally it goes out to like galleys and arcs and, you know, more people will get more eyeballs on it. That works. Um, we have another question from the audience. I think, Leah, this would be a good one to start with you for. It's, uh, what are your recommendations for finding a developmental editor to work with? And what makes a good fit? Okay. Um, so for most of the clients that I work with, they, um, I'm a part of some Facebook groups, um, fantasy Facebook group, fantasy writer Facebook groups. And um, that's how I found a couple of clients. They reached out because um, uh, they knew I was a developmental editor and they were like, um, I'm interested in working with you, uh, what should we do? And I, um, and, you know, just start a conversation with them. And um, the good fit part is just, we kind of touched on it um, earlier with the sample edit, just seeing how um, the sample edit is for on the author side, just to see how I, as an editor work. Um, sometimes they don't, uh, with indie authors, they might not know exactly how deep of an edit they want. So with the, um, with the edit, it kind of, I, since they can't sometimes articulate what they want or they think they want one thing when they really mean another, I just kind of do what I think needs to be done in the sample edit. So that way, um, when they get it back, uh, they can decide if they want to work with me, if they think that my vision for their manuscript matches theirs. Um, that's pretty much what I mean by good fit. I'm not sure if anyone else has anything else to add to that. Mia, you contract directly with writers too, so I think that this might be a good one for you. Um, sometimes it's just not possible to know what the fit is until you actually get into the manuscript and the sample. Um, what clients, I'm not, I'm not trying to like slag on clients here, but some do understand that the sample edit is like for the first three chapters or the first chapter or the first, you know, 20 pages of your sample and they polish that really well and they'll pull a bait and switch on you and the rest of the manuscript is like in shambles. And so, um, again, sometimes it is not possible to know until you get the whole thing and the contract's already been locked down. Um, I think in that case, you can ask for like a larger, um, a larger part. Like if we don't, if we just don't fit, if I'm reading this manuscript and I go, oh no, um, my strengths are not these strengths. Um, I will do my very best in that case to, to edit in the most technical way possible, right? So if I'm looking at things like structure or pacing, I can determine just by reading the manuscript that, you know, what sort of structure we've got here. And then we start calling out like, like on my end, and I, I don't tell the author this, like on my end, like what are the beats? Where do they need to go? And this is extremely technical and not emotional and that, that alleviates some of the burden on me for the editing. Thank you. That makes good sense. Kate, did you have anything to add? No, not okay. so much on that end. Yeah. Probably cultural fits um, work, especially if you are writing marginalizations that are not your own. Uh, the pitfall with that is I used to sensitivity read um, for black characters, some mental illness, queerness, whatever, um, and quit that. Um, because a lot of it was, um, I am not these things, show me how to write these things passably. Um, and there, uh, there, there was a lot of, I, I don't know if anyone follows me on Twitter. Um, I do a lot of statistical analyses about trends that are happening, um, in publishing. Um, and so, uh, CCBC also does, um, studies like that, things that are about a uh, representation um, versus who is authoring these works. And what's found um, for about the third or fourth year running now um, is that stories that are about Black writers um, are the least likely to be written by Black authors. Um, and we are the only demographic um, who owns less than 50% of our, our representation in Kidlet. Um, and so there are questions about why that is and whatever. 
Um, but the sensitivity reading option, I think, has allowed people to feel involved, like, oh, well, I consulted a black person, so, you know, this, this is great. Um, so I don't do that anymore. So when you're looking for um, a developmental editor and you have black characters or there's like a regional dialect you don't know, or there's an experience somewhere within a marginalization or whatever, you want to hire um, a developmental editor um, who has some kind of awareness of these elements. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, I just did a, I just read a book that had a La Llorona character in it that an editor, this was, is more sort of a cautionary tale for writers. If you do have cultural elements in your book, stick with them because they had turned La Llorona into the weeper and therefore sucked all the stuffing out of it. And this is a major house and it made me so very like angry and sad. So definitely stick by, this is one place where you can disagree with an editor um, and you are absolutely in the right. If it's anything about your culture and the editor does not share your culture, stick to your guns. Mm -hmm. um, I will, also, oh, sorry, go ahead, Leah. Sorry. Um, I'd also just like to add that to, to find other kind of like freelance editors, you can always check out the Editorial Freelancers Association or um, ACES, the Society of Editing or even um, the editors of color database, if you're looking for like a specific type of developmental editor. So, so you have cultural elements, of, sorry, about in your about manuscript. Oh no, are you okay? Um, with regards to pushing back on edits that from an editor who doesn't understand the cultural aspect of your manuscript, I feel very strongly about like holding your ground over there because this is something that you, you know very intimately as the person writing it. Um, and if, the um, if the editor doesn't understand, and if if you capitulate and go, okay, yeah, I'm going to change it. That change will very likely get reflected in everything else surrounding the manuscript: your cover, your copy, your um, like any promo copy, your promotion and marketing. So if it's an if it's a really important element, like you know, you know what you know, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, that makes me wonder, um, how, how do you as an editor, and Mia, we'll start with you just because you made me think of this. Um, how do you balance what the author wants to say or the way they're saying it with what the publisher wants or what readers are going to want? Hmm. I... I really don't like being in a situation like that because um, I want the author's vision to be the primary vision. So um, if there is pushback, um, if it comes to me, I'm going to just stand with the author because like, this is not my job to speak for the author. It is my job to support the author. Any other perspectives on that? I saw a lot of nodding. It sounds like we're all on team author there. That's awesome. And um, I'm curious, Elle, because you've worked in acquisitions, is that something that you find when you're acquiring that you're taking yeah. stories that you can stand behind in some way? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's again about a uh, power differential. I'm always going to err on the side of the person with the least power in the situation. So it's um, writing, it's, it's an art. I'm going to stand with the artist. Um, if it's being, if I'm being assigned something, um, from a publisher already they've uh they've acquired it hopefully um because it's it's already in uh it's already structurally something that they can they they can get behind they're not acquiring it for the purposes of changing it to fit you know within the publisher's box so i would hope that that's the reason um they do it but in situations where it's not i'm always on the author's side right and so when there's a rejection how should an author read that when their story has been rejected? It's rejected like as an editorial client or at well, what if, if if you're acquiring and you decide not you pass on a work. Um, rejection is just a huge you part of publishing. Do you back on that or is it just that's just part of publishing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you, you try to be there, you know, for people as, as much as you can. Um, at the end of the day, this is a, it's a profession. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're not, you know, besties by any means, but I do still care about, you know, you being able to sleep that night. 
Um, mm -hmm. So if it's my job to deliver any rejections, it's going to be in the most um, compassionate way possible um, without, you know, overextending myself. Like you can't, um, you know, everyone's not your baby. You can't take care of everyone all the time. Um, and so if you are trying to get into publishing, just know that at, at any stage, no matter how big a name you become, you will, you know, face rejections and you have to be prepared to deal with that. I always tell my students a rejection means you just had your story read by a very cool editor. Lucky you, you know, just keep moving on and you never know. And if it's a positive rejection, that's huge because the next time you come out with a story that might be a better fit, fit um, they've already read you. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to take the slightly um, harder line than, than L took with regards to rejections. Yes, agreed. Rejection happens everywhere all the time. Like I recommend being rejected at least like once a day just to keep that muscle strong. You know, um, the form rejections that come out from from magazines and other, you know, short thick publications are a means and like maybe authors don't know this. The form rejections are a means to protect the editorial team and also to protect the author because writing is so subjective. What I think is not necessarily what the author thinks. And if we open a dialogue with feedback, which does also take time, if we open a dialogue with feedback, then that ends up taking away time from reading the rest of the submissions. Um, when we take something on, we all have to feel really strongly about it. Like um, it is both a yes, I know exactly what to do with this piece, but also a yes, I'm super excited about this piece and I want to shout it out to everybody. Excellent. Also, if you do get a uh, rejection with notes, that is that editor has taken time with you and that is a huge, huge thing. Um, people responding in a negative way to that kind of rejection really drives me nuts because it, yeah, anyway, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Yeah, that's a lot more than just maybe it's good, but I really don't have time to tell you, mm -hmm. which is really what a lot of form rejections are. I've told uh, people before that um, that form rejection is like it, it's not a value judgment on your work. It is a vibe check. You didn't pass you. Um, I've heard other people make this analogy when you go to the bookstore, you walk by literally thousands of books and not one of them catches your eye. I am. I have been known to walk into a bookstore, do the circuit and leave empty handed. So that's basically like reading subs. Um, they're all very good books. I'm very sure of that. Uh, not that they didn't have the spark for me though. Checks out. We have another question from the audience. Um, Kate, this might be a good one to start with you on. Margaret is asking, how well should a freelance editor understand your genre? That's really, I've, I've actually only had experience of non genre person reading genre through my beta reader. And that's always kind of a hilarious experience. Like, um, you know, my friend said, I don't understand. Is it, is she the wolf? And is she is, if she is, wasn't that murder? And is she going to get arrested? You know, there are things like that. So, yeah, it is important that your freelance editor understands where you're coming from, because if there are people who have very realist minds and they don't read genre and they don't understand it, and that's okay. They're doing other things with their brains, but if they're not getting what you are at the heart of your story doing, then it's the wrong editor for you. I see a lot of nodding. Anyone have a uh, one to that or have an anecdote? <laughs> When I see the nods and smiles, I figure someone's got a good story. Mm, all right, client confidentiality. I do. I know uh, what you say about that, but I was going to punt it to Leah in case she wanted to say something first. Okay. All right, Leah, you're on then. So, um, I think a freelance editor needs to have a foot in your in the genre um, because it is not possible to edit for everything. So, I've had literary fiction show up at my door, and I've had to shepherd it right out the door because that is not my strength. I read it. I enjoy it. That is not something I have approached analytically, so I would not be a good fit for that. So, yes, I contract a freelance editor who does read widely and deeply and is up to date in the genre that you are writing in. Excellent. And, you know, it's interesting hearing all this come up because you're all writers with substantial credits as well. So how would you say that being a writer working in this field informs your work as an editor in this field. Elle, I'd love to hear from you. Let's start. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very useful in terms of figuring out how to communicate directly with authors. You, as an author, you kind of know um, uh, 
precisely how much ego stroking needs to happen uh, during the editorial process in order to keep anybody from from losing it. Um, um, I think, too. Let me see. Most of just about everything I edit it edit is um, is specfic. Um, and so all of my, I think all but maybe two of my freelance clients have been um, specific. Um, it's been it's been interesting to develop other people's speculative works and not kind of fold elements of of what I read into uh, my own writing. Um, which is one of the reasons, like, I, I mainly read nonfiction or whatever for world building purposes or whatever. I, I find it difficult to read um, SFF entirely as an SFF writer because I don't want my work to become derivative. I don't want to accidentally or subconsciously, you know, borrow things from other texts. Um, so it's it's been great for growing um, my community. Like a lot of the clients I end up taking on um, end up in a social space with me at some point. I don't know how that happens, um, but um, I don't know. It, I, I enjoy it, I guess. Great. Leah, you're next up on my screen. Um, I don't really have too much to add, though. I do find that while um, while I'm editing clients or just like right after I'm finished with the client and um, I kind of get like a second wind on my own work, so that's always fun. Mia? Um, I'm going to be the complete opposite and say that what I edit doesn't really have too much of an influence on what I write, like on a nuts and bolts level, because um, what I'm interested in is usually not what everybody else is interested in. So um, <laughs> in, in terms of, you know, like uh, at every level of the house from basement to attic, um, what I'm looking at for myself is um, is a challenge to me. So I'm the only one who can rise to it. Right. Um, I will say that writing and reading or reading a lot of genre because um, I have a foot in romance also. So reading a lot of sci fi fantasy and romance allows me to see what the trends are and like what the shapes like what's what's congealing in our future. So um, I have a much better idea of, oh, like if you're um, if you're concerned about saleability, like what is your what is your hardest take on this? And I will tell them, okay, well, this is what I see in from my little corner. I find okay. editing editing feeds my writing because the, it's a it's a part of the brain that ends up making my writing sort of better. I'm looking for the same stuff in my own work. When I find myself writing editorial notes, I'll be like, oh yeah, I wasn't doing that either. Um, and so that's sort of, it's sort of, um, they feed each other in that way. That makes sense. We are closing in on time. Um, do any of you have any favorite resources, any books or podcasts or what have you on writing or editing craft? There's so much stuff out there, I swear. Yeah, books about editing, not so much, but I do recommend for anybody writing a genre to get Wonderbook um, by Jeff Vandermeer because there, there are ways that they different writers talk about writing in there that are very useful to your own um, writing. Um, I don't have any particular favorite craft books because I'm notorious for starting craft books and never finishing craft books. I'm so sorry, Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, I do recommend editing others to increase your own chops. Read for others, send others critique and feedback and, and just you know try to keep a steady stream, even if it's a small stream of writing coming toward you instead of out. Will you write that book, Mia? Because editing others, I honestly wrote it down. I thought you were naming a book, so. Oh my gosh, no. Get on that. <laughs> um, do you mean- yeah, There's a market now. Ursula's <laughs> book? <laughs> <laughs> well, in closing, I'd like to know what you love most about working on a manuscript with a writer. Elle, what would you say you love the most about working on a manuscript? As an editor? Um, being able to kind of get lost in worlds that I didn't write. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in kind of shaping these things for wherever they end up. 
um, my editorial approach is always to feed whatever it is the author's goal is. Sometimes it's trad pub, sometimes it's, you know, making sure things are structurally sound. So it's not like a self pub flop or something. Um, uh, but just it's uh, editorial is a, it's a, again, it's a, it's a position of care. Um, this can be a callous industry. Um, and so people being able to trust me with their work um, in order to, you know, make it into something um, they're proud of at the very least, I think is, is probably my favorite part. I think that speaks for all of us pretty well, but if anyone has something brief they'd like to add, we have just enough. Um, I like the puzzle of editing, making everything fit together according to the author's vision, and then being a guidepost for the author when they go um, on to revision. I love seeing something that the author didn't know they were doing that is so amazing. Um, getting up inside there and saying, you just did a thing here, and often they are absolutely stunned that it happened. Wonderful. Leah, do you have any more thoughts on that? No, that everything that everyone said is great. And I agree with it. I, I agree. This has been a wonderful panel. Thank you all so much. Kate Maruyama, LD Lewis, guest of honor, Leah Rambat, Nia Tsai. You've all given us a lot to think about. Um, everybody, I'm going to go hang out in the Houdini Discord channel for a little bit. I hope that some of you may be able to as well. And we can uh, chat, see if there are any questions left that someone was too shy to ask. Thank so you thanks, all everybody, very much. for coming. Yeah. Yes, thank you. thank you for joining us at Next Step in Editing at Western Town.